it is so amazing uh, to see so many early risers here uh, to celebrate our work together uh, to create a world where alternative proteins are no longer alternative. Um, I hope you have been enjoying the conference so far. Uh, since GFI started in 2015, we have been watching an alternative proteins version of Moore's Law, where government support and scientific interest in alternative proteins are more or less doubling on an annual basis. I absolutely loved yesterday morning uh, when GFI Senior Vice President for Science and Technology, Liz Specht, asked all of the scientists to stand up, sort of, um, if you're doing this, stand, if you're doing that, stand. Uh, because GFI is, um, at heart, um, a science think tank. And around the world, the plurality of GFI's full-time team members are scientists. Um, I also absolutely loved uh, hearing from Deputy Undersecretary Begg about USDA's support for alternative proteins. I loved hearing from Representative Laura, Rosa DeLauro about congressional support for alternative proteins, and Assemblymember Calra about state government support for alternative proteins. Because it's government support that creates the scientific ecosystem that we need to create the world where alternative proteins are no longer alternative. One thing that I want to underline is just how incredibly bipartisan this work is. Uh, GFI has a primary leave behind uh, for our federal lobbying in Washington, D.C. And the biggest quote on it um, is from Donald Trump's Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, uh, talking about the Trump administration and USDA under Purdue and FDA um, under uh, Trump's FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, um, their commitment to alternative proteins. And we've seen that grow um, as uh, Deputy Undersecretary Begg talked about um, under Harkin and Biden. The theory of change is res resonating more and more and more across the political spectrum. Uh, that's all the mission critical work we're talking about around climate and global health and food security. Uh, but it's also about jobs. It's also about economic activity. McKinsey uh, analysts, McKinsey economists, have said the alternative protein industry could be worth between $700 billion and $1.1 trillion by 2050 and generate 83 million good jobs. The Center for Strategic and International Studies argues that governments should prioritize alternative proteins in the same way that they prioritize other advanced technologies. So I am just incredibly excited about what's happening in the U.S. and even more excited about what's happening in the other six regions of the world where you're going, that you're going to hear from today. You're going to hear about India, Israel, Brazil, Singapore, Europe, and China. Um, and I think you're going to be amazed. Our regional leaders will be joined on stage by William Chen, a close partner uh, to GFI in Singapore. He's Director of Food Science and Technology at Nanyang Technological Universities, um, one of the top technological universities in the world, as well as Min Hao Wang, who is the Director of Food and Nutrition um, at what is essentially um, Singapore's National Science Foundation, ASTAR, the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research, their Biomedical Research Council. Um, they have been such a close partner to GFI and such a champion of what everybody in this room is working on. So we're going to start with Brazil, Europe, and Israel with a series of short presentations from each region. And then we're going to move to Asia, where we're going to have a deep dive discussion of what's happening in India, Singapore, and China. I think you'll be very impressed and excited uh, by everything that you're about to hear. And I want to underline uh, that we can't cover 5% you know, of it in the hour that we have. So if you want to learn more, um, all of these regions have websites. Uh, and if you go to gfi.org in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see global. Uh, and you can click on that and find out more about what's happening in all of the regions and sign up for their newsletters. So with that, I want to welcome uh, Nir Goldstein, who is the CEO of GFI uh, Israel, uh, Ola Goldman, who is the Vice President for Policy for GFI Israel, Alex Mares, uh, who is the Managing Director for GFI Europe, um, and Gustavo Guadagnini, who is the CEO of GFI Brazil. And we are going to kick off with Gus, so please give him a warm welcome. He's going to tell you what's happening in Brazil.
Thank you, thank you. Good morning for everyone that woke up early to come here and listen about alternative protein across the globe. We have an exciting industry going on and you see how much it is advancing in all the countries that we are. I will start with the big picture in Brazil. We recently had a change in the government and now we have um, a government in Brazil. We came from a period where the government was more focused on business, on the business side, and now we have a new government that is much more focused on the sustainability, food Sorry security, and multilateral engagement. So what we can expect from Brazil as a big picture is that the country will try to play a bigger, a larger role in these multilateral occasions. We are going to host COP30, so I expect you all are going to be in Brazil visiting us in the Amazon region in a couple of years. And this will lead to a series of policies that are going to be aiming uh, the sustainability, the ESG aspect of how the country wants to play. And of course, Alternative Protein is now playing an important role in this strategy. Brazil is deeply impacted by the animal production in the country. And to solve this problem, we need to go use Alternative Protein as one of the solutions to reach this goal. And thinking about regulatory, where we are is that the Brazilian government has just submitted the regulatory proposal. So we have a law project that is in public consultation, and this is going to be one of the most uh, progressive regulatory frameworks so far if it gets approved. So Brazil is allowing companies to use terms like meat, even milk, um, sausages, and everything that is related to the animal products um, if they put it in the package that the product is vegetable and it's um, copying the animal product somehow. So you just need to be transparent, but all the names will be allowed, and this is the regulatory proposal that is happening in Brazil right now. If it just gets approved, it will be a big win for us all. And talking about science, Brazil is also a huge potential for science. If you, if you think on most of the scientific sites that we have, you probably won't think in Brazil. Like you don't have a cell phone that comes from Brazil. You don't have most of your technology coming from Brazil. But thinking specifically in agribusiness, Brazil is a powerhouse. It is one of the largest grain producers in the world, one of the largest meat producers in the world. And this means that we have a whole ecosystem of universities and people that are studying this agribusiness, that are studying these sciences. So Brazil now is uh, playing a strong role here even within GFI. I put some numbers of what projects we already funded. So we funded already over $2.5 million of research in Brazil and projects, 31 projects that go all across the alternative protein field in cultivated meat, plant-based and fermentation. Brazil has strong universities, has strong researchers, and is very well positioned to collaborate with the science development for the entire world. Also, we have our uh, engagement with the universities is growing every day. So now we have over 58 universities and research centers that are engaged with us and research our projects happening in plant-based fermentation and cultivated meat. Again, Brazil is trying to play a role in this. It is a national strategy to be one of the strongest countries in alternative protein because we will keep us leading the agribusiness sector in the world and that's a main priority from this government. It was a main priority from the previous government as well and it's probably going to keep in the long term. And finally, on the science side, it's important for us to say that Brazil has a way to collaborate. I check my timing. Has ways to collaborate, um, considering not only our largest grain producing like soy, but also our biodiversity. Brazil is the house of the largest biodiversity of the world, and GFI has a research grants program that is aiming to develop new ingredients from the biodiversity of Brazil that can be used by the alternative protein industry. We already have, um, more, we have 20 uh, research projects that were funded by GFI, and they, were, they are researching the Amazon forest and the Cerrado also, that's another biome, another forest of Brazil, to deliver ingredients that can be used in a very 
sustainable way with positive social impact and can help us to improve the products in Brazil and decrease their costs. So this is a project that GFI started and it's one that we are very proud of. Uh, we are now working directly in the Amazon forest. We are working directly in the Serrano to bring sustainability to alternative proteins. And I finished speaking a little bit about the markets. Um, we have today a market that is growing. Consumers are accepting alternative proteins. We see that 67% of the Brazilians reduced their meat consumption. This is a research that GFI commissioned in the last year. Of course, this is driving by a number of factors, including the high price of meat right now. But 34% of the Brazilians said they are replacing only or mainly with plant-based meats. So they are eating less meat and they are replacing also with plant-based meat. There is still a large portion of people that are replacing with whole foods vegetables and that's okay as well. But we see that the plant-based industry is already playing a role. Also 28% of the Brazilians now consider themselves to be flexitarians. We have over 100 companies playing on the plant-based side and 12 companies playing on cultivated meat and um, fermentation. So just to finish, a little bit about the market. Um, these numbers are in Brazilian reais, so it's uh, about five. But we had a 42% growth of the market last year. And that means that the total market in Brazil, this is Mintel data, is about $164 million right now. Uh, from the total $271 million that is in Latin America. So Brazil still plays the most relevant role in Latin America. The market is growing. We are seeing, of course, many difficulties as we see in other countries. We are experiencing some consolidation of the companies, some startups going out of the business, but that doesn't mean that the total market is not growing. We grew 42% last year and we will keep growing in the future. So I expect you all to be eating alternative protein in Brazil in the next COP two years from now. Thank you so much, and I'll hand over to Alex in Europe. Morning, everybody. Um, Europe is a pretty fascinating place. Um, five minutes to try to talk about what's happening in a market of 450 million people and 45 plus countries is um, going to be an exhausting task. So I'll focus on the really highlight bits. So, in a similar picture to what Gus has described, in Europe still the market for plant-based meats is quite exciting right now. So the current value, the sales value of plant-based foods in 2022 is 5.8 billion and that's a 21% increase in sales between 2020 and 2022. So similar picture to what Gus was describing. Of course that data finished at the end of 2022 It'll be interesting to see what happens beyond in 2023 as the market is changing. And we have Carlotta Lucas, our senior corporate engagement manager, to thank for the analysis that's happened on this in a very complex picture in many countries across Europe. Um, just to give a bit more detail of what's actually happening at some of the national levels in Europe. So in Germany, some very, very exciting things are happening. Um, in Germany, plant-based uh, sales are really rising. So meat is up 7%, milk is rising 13%. We have the state of the industry report, which is available on our website, which you can download for more detail. And what's really interesting is that meat sales are starting to fall in Germany. And it's one of only a couple of countries where that's starting to happen. We don't yet know if that's directly attributable, if there's what the relationship is between those two things happening. But that's a very exciting prospect to be thinking about. Um, similarly, at the moment in Europe, there are some really large manufacturers who are getting very excited about plant-based meats and who are really investing also in cultivated meats. Um, just to give an example from the plant-based side, Unilever has just set this target of 1.5 billion um, euros in revenue from sales of plant-based products by 2025. That's huge. That's a huge commitment. And similarly, also Carrefour in France um, has teamed up with Unilever and Danone to really drive sales of plant-based products as well. Things are really hotting up. One of the things that we've been speaking about at this conference uh, yesterday, there was a really exciting panel looking at some of the trade associations. Some of them are named here. The Plant-Based Foods Association has a chapter in Europe. Um, the European Alliance for Plant-Based Foods. Um, the Alternative Proteins Association is a national one in the UK. 
You'll see Food Fermentation Europe, which is relatively new in Europe. Uh, and then I've put on a couple of uh, examples of cellular agriculture societies, one in Portugal, one in Germany. There's more in other countries which are starting to appear. And these are really accelerating that momentum. These are really building. So there's an awful lot to be very proud of if you're associated with these trade associations and groups, because this is really what's driving a lot of the momentum and a lot of the progress that's happening. One really exciting side on the policy front, kind of policy science kind of sides where they overlap, there's been a really significant and very exciting increase in how funding is happening. So you'll see that Denmark has invested nearly 100 million US dollars in a fund to advance the plant-based food industry uh, last year. Um, extremely exciting. Denmark is a real powerhouse uh, and there's lots of great work happening. Um, the UK RI number there, 43 million euros since, uh, sorry, pounds since 2012. In that 11-year period, I think what's really exciting with that number is that for the first 10-year period, saw one-third of that amount, and the last 18 months saw the other two-thirds as things are really starting to rise and increase. Um, the Netherlands commitment, which I put there, is, we believe, a world record for funding for cultivated meats uh, and cellular agriculture capacities, which is, again, very exciting. Still, more is needed. Um, the 25 million unlocked for Horizon Europe is for work in the 2023-2024 um, work program, which they're doing to support alternative proteins as well. Bit of a change of pace. This picture is a flywheel, an example of a flywheel. Um, and this says a couple of things to me personally. So the person that invented this particular machine is a guy called Richard Trevithick, uh, who lives down in the, or lived down in the southwest of the UK a couple of hundred years ago. Um, his inventions really drove uh, engineering. They drove progress at the time. And it says a couple of things to me. Firstly, we've kind of been here before. We've solved a lot of technological challenges and overcome what at the time would have been quite amazing modern technology and engineering solutions. So in the old continent of Europe, we have precedent for being here before. This is not the first time that we've trodden some of these paths. Um, the other thing that I really get from this kind of picture is that flywheel approach. It takes a lot of energy to get the momentum driving for that flywheel so that in time, that kinetic energy just kind of keeps on going and helps to perpetuate the whole system. So we're still in the early days in Europe. All of these numbers that I'm showing you are extremely exciting and we're seeing that uptick, but there's still some big challenges to get that flywheel going at the speed that we need it to be going at. So we need more research and development money. We need more scientists. It's so exciting to see the energy that the Alternative Protein Project students have brought to this conference. We need more of that. We need more students developing uh, alternative protein solutions. Um, more government investment. So places like um, in Germany, just as an example, VAT in Germany on plant-based milks is currently 19%, whereas for dairy, it's 7%. There needs to be some work there to just equalize that and make a more level playing field. So government support for companies, for policies that need to happen, super exciting and very, very important. Um, there's some specific challenges in different corners of Europe as well. It's not universally countries against each other, but Europe is a big place with lots of diverse cultures, lots of diverse approaches to farming. So we need to be taking people on that journey together. We need to be listening to people, understanding concerns and fears that they might have about new exciting technology, which these days to us might look quite old. But as new things are developed, these things might be a little bit alarming for people and we need to listen, we need to understand how to take people on this journey with us. Um, on that, I will hand over to Nir and Allah to speak to you more about Israel. Wow, uh, thank you, Alex. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, so excited to be here with you uh, this morning. Uh, and I'm also very curious to learn about you before I begin. Uh, so let's do a quick survey. Uh, do you mind raising your hand if you came here from abroad, from outside the US, by a show of hand? Just, oh, oh, wow. Anyone local here? All right, <laughs> All right great. Um, and also, please raise your hand if you come from the public sector. Any government representatives here? Don't be shy. All right, cool. So we have a few. Um, all right, cool. So let's begin. So I think that my role today uh, is to give you a glance, a very high-level bird's eye view of how uh, G5 and the government of Israel are advancing alternative protein in Israel. You might, uh, might have heard that uh, Israel is a real superpower in terms of alternative uh, proteins, and we have the Israeli government 
all behind us. So let's take a quick view on how, from the government view, uh, alternative proteins are seen. Uh, well, for Israel, as a very small country of only 10 million people, we developed together with the government a vision for what it could be in the future. And the vision is that we want to create a complete alternative protein innovation ecosystem locally. And that ecosystem is uh, hopefully going to be comprised of the R&D section from research enabling uh, to the actual research itself, but very, very much uh, uh, important also to make sure that the technology is being transferred, that we are doing commercialization uh, in a quick and efficient manner. The second phase is the production all the way from entrepreneurship uh, to uh, manufacturing and distribution, creating demand, and of course what we are all here for is to create alternative consumption, to make sure that the products are getting to market and are being consumed. So this is what, what we want to see. Uh, but what is the government's role in all of this? Well, in Israel, uh, the government um, views its role in um, innovation ecosystems as um, they only intervene where they feel that they can effectively overcome value chain gaps or where they identify uh, an opportunity, a very unique opportunity that they can leverage. And I think that our role at GFI is to make sure that we convey to the government the needs and the gaps of our alternative protein ecosystem and help the government understand how can they effectively use the tools that they have uh, to make a change. So let's take a very quick overview of what we've done in the past couple of years and then take a look ahead and also uh, we have a big announcement to make, uh, so let's see if we, uh, let's begin. All right, so in terms of research, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that the ecosystem has everything that we call research enabling. So this means that uh, um, researchers are excited, that they have funding opportunities, that they have the infrastructure, um, and, they, and then they can conduct, of course, the research, and then we need to uh, commercialize it. When we took a look at the Israeli ecosystem, we saw that actually we have plenty of researchers uh, already active in the field, more than 60 academic labs uh, that have open um, research pr uh, projects in the field, and also we, we are very excited that two of the world's first alternative protein research centers were announced in the last year or so in Israel. One of them is uh, by Professor Yoav Livni here from the Technion, and also uh, in the Hebrew University. So what's next? Well, together with the government, we are aiming to have more than 200 research researchers active in the field by 2026, um, and so we identified uh, multiple gaps. One, we wanted to get the um, wider research ecosystem excited about the field. And therefore, together with the government, we made sure that when they declared the top five national research uh, priorities, alternative protein was right up there. And this was, meant to meant, this was meant to signal to the research community, to the funding community, to all of the other government authorities, and also to the nonprofit uh, research funders that this is important and that the government is behind this. So this was step one. Step two was to um, ignite some additional research. Uh, what we found actually is that mature research that has some uh, initial results could, could get funding pretty easily. What we lacked was the early stage seed funding for alternative protein research, uh, which is not something that has been traditionally done before, uh, unlike other fields that are more developed like cancer, uh, etc. So together with the government, uh, GFI, together with the Innovation Authority, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, and the Ministry of Science, we partner together to create an annual fund of more than $1.5 million every year to fund about 15 research uh, projects every year or so. Uh, and here's a great place to thank our family of uh, donors who allow us to be a part of this exciting uh, endeavor. The second phase, of course, is innovation. It's very important for us to take the research conducted very quickly and very efficiently to the market. Um, so Israel has done this pretty efficiently. We are second worldwide, not per capita, but in total um, VC investments in the field. More than $1.2 billion have been invested in Israel, uh, Israeli startups over the past uh, few years. Um, but what are the gaps? What still needs to happen? Uh, well, first of all, we identified a gap in risky and long-term projects funding, especially in today's uh, funding um, atmosphere. The second gap that we identified as a trusted advisor of the government together with the government 
was that the academia and business sector are sometimes having uh, trouble exchanging ideas, exchanging knowledge due to the obvious uh, business and uh, IP constraints. And the third challenge was that uh, we lack scale-up infrastructure. Now this might uh, be existing infrastructure in Europe and in the US, uh, but we felt like that in order to create, to complete the loop in Israel, to make sure that we have the research close to the scale-up and to the manufacturing and the, con and the consumption, we wanted to have everything close by in Israel. So, uh, so far in the last couple of years, two exciting projects that we have already um, managed to execute the one was the world's first and largest, of course, uh, at this time, uh, cultivated meat consortium comprised of more than uh, four companies. This is also startups, but also big food manufacturers and 10 academic labs um, funded uh, by the Innovation Authority with more than $18 million. And this is a really exciting project. I can tell you that uh, one year in, we are already seeing some very exciting results of what is working but also what's not working, uh, and, and the feedback here is great, and I'm really excited to see um, the ecosystem that is being created around cultivated meat in Israel. The second thing is, as I mentioned, uh, scale-up. We focused for the first time on fermentation, uh, precision fermentation scale-up. We're going to create uh, volumes of up to 10,000 liters in Israel to serve the ecosystem. Uh, and the third and last part of our value chain was, of course, creating demand, creating, uh, allowing for consumption. Actu actually, uh, we don't have a demand problem. Israel has got a huge uh, demand already. In uh, dairy products, we are already 20% of the um, uh, milk market in Israel is plant-based. And uh, in terms of meat, we're actually at 6% of the Israeli meat market is plant-based right now. Uh, so a very exciting market. We're good with demand. The problem is, of course, in, uh, as in many other places, regulation. In Israel, the regulator is very small. It was uh, um, uh, built in order to um, essentially just uh, rely on the FDA. So everything that we consume in Israel in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, we just rely on the FDA, like many other smaller countries in the world. When it comes to novel food, to alternative proteins, uh, we want to be the first in the, in the world. We have a very healthy competition going on uh, with Singapore, with the U.S., with the U.K. Uh, so what we had to do together with the government is to create um, um, a, a regulator that has the capacity to be co competitive uh, in a global manner, and this is what we're working on. A lot of investment has gone into this field by the Prime Minister's Office and the Ministry of Health. So this is uh, what we've done in the last couple of years. Going forward, we are working very closely with the Prime Minister's Office in Israel to make sure that we have a national policy plan uh, for the next five years. I can't share it uh, uh, right now with all of you, but I can say that we're expecting to see some, something like um, uh, $100 million invested in the field uh, for the next five years. And the outcome that the government is expecting to have from this plan is not only to create more than 300 startups in the field, but also 50,000 jobs also, which is a large amount for a small country like ours. Uh, the ROI here for the return on investment for the government here is immense. For, for this amount of money, they expect to get more than $8 billion in taxes in the next uh, decade or so. And we're hoping to get this plan uh, very smooth, smoothly integrated into the national uh, sustainability and food security um, uh, plans. So with that in mind, I would like to invite Ala Waldman to share some of the lessons we've learned and also to make uh, an exciting announcement. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm happy to continue uh, sharing some more updates from Israel, but also with a glance to the world. We've been working with the Israeli government for about three years now, uh, implementing the national policy plan. And though Israel is probably not a reference country or a government to many countries in the world, but there are some key learnings that we've gathered that we believe uh, are relevant for many other countries in the world that could help them promote the field locally and establish alternative protein strategies. We've taken these learnings and created a methodology that we believe can support more countries and organizations. And it all starts with defining a motivation. What is the motivation from a country's point of view? 
what really triggers the country to change, to make an action, to put the field on the agenda. For Israel, creating an economic engine has really opened the door for us. Leveraging the potential gains that developing alternative protein industry in Israel with the numbers that Nir had just shown has become really game changer. As we continued, we're also able to show the um, significant opportunities that developing alternative proteins could bring to a country that is highly dependent on food imports. 90% of the beef in Israel is imported, 100% of the grain for feed is imported. So this has become another lever for support. Once we have a clear motivation of what stands at the eyes of the government, the next step is defining a vision. A vision that really defines the country's role in the global food system. I hope we all share the same belief that the global food system is going to change. And we believe it's time for more countries in the world to find their role in this evolving new food system. Who are those countries that are going to lead on agricultural produce and be the suppliers of raw material for the industry? Who are those that are going to uh, promote all the advance, advanced research in the field? Who are those that are going to promote venture creation and more and more startups? Who are those that are going to invest in heavy manufacturing for the scale-up? And who are those that are going to open the market for these products? This is the time, to, the goal of the vision is to define the areas where the country would play. And this is a statement given by the Israeli Innovation Authority, who has invested about $70 million for the past three years, taking the innovation one step further, including also production for local and regional use. And lastly is the strategy. It has to be holistic. It has to continue the consider the entire value chain of alternative proteins from the basic research up to the consumer. It has to be tailored to the actual local ecosystem. Who are the players? Who are the food manufacturers? Who are the adjacent industries that are in the country? And it has to be detailed enough to include a concrete action plan and to include the evaluation of the gains that the country will get by investing in the field. And maybe just before I finish, I cannot think of a more appropriate opportunity to announce a new public funding rather than uh, in a session that focuses on government funding and to announce four countries that decided to collaborate and put alternative protein on their agenda and announce a collaborative call for proposal, Singapore, Switzerland, Sweden, and Israel have joined together to invest money in more R&D research. So if you are from these countries, please check in. And if you are not, let's use this as an example and do more examples like that. Thank you. All right. Um, so it was uh, just wonderful to hear what's happening in Israel, uh, Europe, and Brazil. Uh, people often ask why GFI has selected the areas of the world uh, to operate in that we've selected. Um, and it really is just a two-question rubric. Uh, question one is, does the government fund significant amounts of science? Do we think we can convince them uh, that they should be funding in this area? Um, and then question two is, uh, does the country have world-class scientific institutions? So that's the reason we're in Brazil, uh, Israel, focused on EC, Germany, the UK. Uh, those governments have funded massive amounts of science and they have world-class scientific institutions. Uh, but the story of solar is the story of Asian science and Asian manufacturing and supply chains. So too the story of EV battery production and EV innovation, of vaccine production, and so much more. This is also true of a lot of other technologies. So India was the first country to see the promise of cultivated meat as a response to malnutrition. Uh, the country was granting to cultivated meat, the first country to do that um, after the Netherlands back in 2005. 
to their Institute of Chemical Technology and to their Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. India is now uh, a leader in alternative proteins and has made it a national strategic priority. Singapore was selling cultivated meat two and a half years before any other country on the face of the planet, before the U.S. showed up, was also the first government to go seriously all in supporting its alternative protein uh, science and innovation. China recently included alternative proteins as a food solution in both its bioeconomy and its farm policy. Um, again, before any other country, the U.S. has done that now. And we've seen how both national and regional governments have been supporting research and development and industry, uh, building out alternative proteins in China. So I could go on and on, but we have a stellar group of speakers who are leading this work in these key countries. Uh, so I'd like to hand off to GFI APAC Managing Director Mirta Gasker, who is going to introduce them and lead part two of this plenary. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, as Bruce shared, Asia has a big role to play in scaling up climate solutions. So I'm very happy to have a conversation about scaling up this climate solution, namely alternative proteins, in the region, our region, that is home to 60% of the world's population. So it's been projected that between 2017 and 2050, in Asia Pacific, we will see the demand for meat and seafood rise with 78%. Our region is also going to be disproportionately disrupted by climate crisis. And we already see that um, supply chain disruptions and public health hazards are already top of mind. So right before uh, COVID hit, China had to cull almost half of its big herd due to a swine flu. And last year in um, Malaysia, they banned the chicken export to Singapore, which was quite distressful for many of my country people, fellow country people, um, because of the supply chain disruptions due to the war in Ukraine. So food security is high on the agenda of many, if not all, of the governments in our region. Um, so, um, so my team, I'm, I'm running GFI APAC, headquartered in Singapore, and we're 13 people strong. Sneha is running GFI India, and her team is 15 people strong. So we're not even 30 people trying to accomplish our mission in the Asia region. Um, as you can imagine, that's nearly enough, ne not hardly enough, I should say, um, people to do so. Um, so we're very happy to be able to collaborate a lot with key stakeholders from national governments, from industry, from academia. So I'm very pleased to have here with us on stage Doris Lee, who is the CEO of GFIC, our strategic partner in China. Professor William Chen, next to me who is the director of the Food Science and Technology Program of Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And together with William, we have launched the first um, alternative protein undergraduate uh, university course in the whole of Asia. And then we have Dr. Min Hao Wong, the director of food and nutrition at ASTAR. And uh, Bruce already said, it's the scientific arm of the Singapore government. And with the many different research groups that ASTAR has, and we're collaborating a lot on scientific studies and on publications. So thank you very much for joining Sneha and me today here on the stage. Um, we're gonna do a little um, tour through Asia and I would love to start in China. Um, so uh, Doris, so many people in the audience I think have heard that China included alternative proteins specifically in their 14th national five-year agricultural plan. Um, but what does that actually mean? Hi, thank you, Marta. I hope I can explain that in one minute. I try. So um, I believe like 
many of you have heard about like, things that are happening in China, but like have questions about what does it really mean? Like uh, the, the government has included it, included uh, alternative protein in uh, both the bioeconomy plan and also the agriculture for, uh, 14 five year plans. Um, to basically support alternative protein R&D as a future food solution to support this um, uh, food security cost. Right. So, but if we look at um, what does it really mean for the industry, then we need to look also at the regional level. So I would like to talk actually about two examples in both of like China's biggest stronghold in biotechnology and also the biggest potential market, which is the Jiangsu province and the Guangzhou province. So for Jiangsu province, actually where Shanghai is, if you are familiar with. So for example, in uh, the Jiangsu province, um, one of the leading, uh, world's leading food science university, uh, the Jiangnan University, they have been collaborating with quite a lot of like local corporates to set up R&D center uh, and also to set up like, for example, plant-based meat uh, factory with one of the local traditional food company called Wu Fangzai. And then um, that's not it. They also have received support from the government to set up a future food science center to focus um, with a focus on um, both plant-based fermentation and cultivated meat food research. Yeah. So um, this is one of the um, just one of the many universities in China that have been setting up um, research centers as such. And I also want to mention that two of China's leading cultivated meat startup are also in this region, including Joe's Future Food and um, and also Salex which um, um, Ziliang, the CEO, is here today. And we will be having a round table at lunch if you would love to talk to us about China. So they also launched the pilot facilities in Shanghai just last month. Yeah. So um, the other um, example will be the Guangzhou province. So um, the Guangdong province, so Guangzhou is a, um, as a main city in the, in the area and also one of the biggest with consumption market and also the pickiest eater. Yeah. So, um, so it's not easy to, of course, uh, to tackle the taste uh, problem of the, these products. But what they are doing is that they also want to just build up an ecosystem for, um, for alternative protein. They actually already have some existing collaborations with, for example, Singapore under the um, Sino Singapore Knowledge City. So, Doris, um, can you tell me why Gangdao? Uh, trying not to butcher the name, um, chose um, Singapore to, um, to collaborate on and not Australia, for example? Well, I, I think the um, or original reason for them is definitely like a strategic reason. But I, I think just like as Allah from GFI Israel said, no one single country can do this alone. So every country has a role to play, right? So I think China is, of course, like known for being like a manufacturing hub and like upscaling and cutting costs and everything. But I think when it comes to a new industry, which is innovation and R&D driven, they will love a partner like Singapore um, to, you know, to work together with. So, um, so we think that under this existing um, um, uh, collaboration platform, which I have to mention is a joint force by the local government and uh, Singapore's capital land. Yeah, so um, we, we think that we can uh, build an ecosystem together bringing together like investors, companies that want to either like um, uh, go abroad from China or like go into China and also very importantly academia and um, and government agencies and actually Professor William Chan here has also been working with this platform and then uh, and also um, there is um, a grant, one of our grantees from the South China Technology University has been working with the NTU on also alternative protein related projects. So this is the kind of collaboration that we want to see more and foster. And then we think only by doing that can we just, can we accelerate the, the, the innovation or the industry development in China. Thank you very much. And I wholeheartedly agree that cross-country collaborations are extremely important and G2G, government to government, um, play a big role in there. Um, we already touched a little bit upon Singapore. So Min Hao, can you maybe share with the audience? I can dream this pitch, of course, but can you please share with the audience um, how Singapore has 
um, developed itself to be the alternative protein hub of Asia. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, so just a quick note about Singapore. We're a little bit unique uh, in that we're very, very small, right? So 5 million people on less than 800 square kilometers of land importing more than 90% of our food. Um, so very, very vulnerable when it comes to food security. Um, but yet we have very high ambition. So we launched something called the 30 by 30, uh, which is to try to achieve 30% of Singaporeans' uh, nutritional needs by 2030. Right? So if you think about it, like so little land, very little land dedicated to farm, uh, but how are we going to hit 30% you know, of our, our food security needs uh, by the year 2030? And to that end, what the Singapore government has done is to actually invest a significant amount of resources uh, into research. Uh, one of the most aggressive countries uh, in the world, I would say, uh, in committing resources. Uh, in fact, we have launched uh, Singapore Food Story 1 and Singapore Food Story 2, a combined quantum of roughly uh, 200 odd uh, million uh, US dollars over the course of about 10 years, um, which is one of the highest amounts I think uh, you have seen you know, other countries um, investing in this area as well. But I think it's fair to say that Singapore has been one of the, the more um, ambitious countries uh, in that regard. Um, so that's you know, one aspect. But still, we are not very satisfied with just you know, government pushing this alone. So we have talked about the flywheel effect. And so how do we actually magnify this 200 million investment? It's really to partner with the private sector as well. Um, and one example of a public-private sector partnership, which uh, I would like to highlight, is actually uh, the, the partnership that the government, uh, through ASTAR, uh, has done with uh, our sovereign wealth fund, uh, Tamasic, via the entity Norasa, in setting up what is called the Food Tech Innovation Center. Um, so that's an example of a public-private partnership, where essentially what we did is to look at, you know, across the ecosystem, uh, what are some of the gaps uh, within the local ecosystem that should um, benefit from some degree of government push uh, because it requires a degree of resources and capex that maybe the startups do not have. Um, so the Food Tech Innovation Center is meant to help uh, startups scale up. So it's focused on the translational pilot scale part uh, before, you know, hopefully it's a launch pad for, for companies to then take off. So that's one example of a of a private partnership, and there are several others which I think uh, William will highlight as well uh, later. Um, uh, just one last thing to highlight, I think Singapore has also been always looking for partners. Uh, so we didn't look, the, the regional ecosystem, I think, uh, as you very well know, there are other countries like Thailand, like Indonesia. Uh, Thailand has the uh, NSTDA, for example, which we have had uh, quite a bit of interactions with as well, and we welcome more uh, of such interactions um, and, and chances to build on the resources already invested. Thank you for sharing, Minao. Um, and it's very clear that for Singapore, food security is the main driver to put in 200 million euros in their food, uh, in their Singapore food story, um, to be willing and, and working towards producing 30% of their nutritional needs and grow them in a, in country, right? Uh, many of you haven't visited uh, Singapore, but Singapore has very, very little land, and there is only, of that very little land, 1% um, committed to, to growing food. So um, solving that by using new technologies to producing food is um, an extremely um, smart thing to do. Um, and that is also uh, one of the reasons that, um, in a recent conversation I had with some key figures um, um, in the Singapore government, um, that they are very excited to see that not just Singapore um, has now um, given approval for a cultivated meat to be sold, but also the US, because that opens up the market and it makes the whole thing much more viable. Um, however, many people came to me after that happened and said, oh, Mirta, what, what about Singapore now? They're not the only country in the world that is selling cultivated meat. Um, so maybe, Minhao, can you um, share a bit how Singapore is basically kind of repositioning itself um, now that it's not only not the only country in the world that sells cultivated meat. Yeah. Um, so actually, I think Singapore cannot be a market by itself, right? Because we're only five million people. Uh, so it's a matter of time. Actually, we welcome uh, the, the signs from from the world that actually this this field is getting more accepted. Having the U.S. now approved it, it greatly expands the the market available for for alternative proteins companies in general. 
uh, where Singapore tries to position itself is really uh, as the hotbed for innovation and research and as a testbed for the world, right? Because we have a very diverse population. Uh, we have good IP laws, uh, good financing. So that's really the part that we try to position ourselves. Uh, additionally, we, we think we're kind of the gold standard when it comes to uh, food safety, right? I, I mean, we talked about the healthy competition uh, between Israel or other jurisdiction, uh, but the reality is that Singapore is the first country to approve cultured meat, and, and William will, will talk about that uh, a bit more. But that's kind of how we, we see, see ourselves, and I say that in, in half jest, but, but uh, you know, it, it, I kind of get you, give you a sense that where you know, we're thinking about it. And what is also very helpful is that because of it, Singapore being such a small country, everybody knows each other. Like the different government agencies are actually talking to each other. They know what the other people are doing, which is very helpful. And if you basically want to get to know the Singapore ecosystem, it will probably cost you a week and then you know everybody you need to know. So please feel free to, to visit us in Singapore and come and learn about the industry. Um, but Minhao, you touched a little bit on uh, food safety. and. William, um, you are, and I need to peek on my, on my paper, you were part of the novel food safety expert working group that the Singapore Food Agency set up to approve that first piece of cultivated chicken and everything that was approved afterwards. So you are our food safety expert. Can you share a bit about Singapore's leadership role in novel food regulations and food safety in specific? Uh, thanks, Merta. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, GFI for inviting uh, us to be here. Uh, it's a huge privilege to be part of this uh, uh, exciting conference. And uh, uh, there are two things that resonate very well with what we do in Singapore. First one is the title of the conference is a path to 2030. Uh, well, Ming Hao explained the 30 by 30, so there's some link to 2030. Uh, we'll have a common goal. The second one uh, is actually the, the uh, Bruce mentioned that the GFI started in 2015. This is where uh, our food science and technology at my university also started off uh, the same year. So we really grown together uh, with GFI. We also thank GFI Apex for strong support. We have launched the first course, uh, uh, undergraduate course at my university on cultivated meat. And uh, uh, we also work very closely with GFI uh, APAC team uh, to reach out to the media, the main media, to raise awareness of this uh, uh, consumer's awareness on the importance of alternative food. And thanks, Ryan, for all the effort. And, and uh, um, the impact of GFI uh, on the um, undergraduate uh, students' awareness is clearly reflected by our, the presence of our student leader uh, who leads uh, this uh, alternative uh, protein project at uh, my university. So coming back to Murda's question, uh, well, I, I, I think uh, Singapore's uh, uh, being the uh, first country to approve the uh, cultivated meat uh, is actually uh, 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 by default because we, as Ming Hao mentioned, we import more than 90% of the food from 170, over 100, uh, 170 countries, so we do not have much of a choice. So this uh, uh, alternative protein is uh, uh, clearly uh, 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 obvious choice for us to, to support. Uh, and therefore, um, the, we are very proud to be uh, the first country to approve the sale and production of uh, a cultivated meat in Singapore. And uh, uh, as Bruce Sertong mentioned, we are still the only country where you can actually eat the uh, cultivated meat product. So I, th I think Murta has tried, uh, I had the privilege to try this uh, uh, cultivated meat uh, uh, pasta. And uh, um, a lot of people always have worried about this uh, uh, cost and texture and taste of this uh, cultivated meat product. I can clearly uh, state that uh, I was eating chicken pasta and at the affordable price, it's nothing compared to modern house state, a modern state house, that kind of thing. So uh, for those who want to try this cultivated meat product, please uh, let Murta and the Singapore people know. Then we'll book a table for you. Right. All right. Uh, so coming back to the uh, regulatory approval, um, Singapore, as uh, Minghao mentioned, um, is, a, is a small country. Uh, it's a very 
sort of a, a good place to test bait all these technology and uh, uh, market uh, reach out. And, and uh, so we, through this um, uh, approval process, we also see the need to align globally. So we are very happy that uh, we're also involved in the uh, global organizations uh, work on this uh, uh, regulatory uh, framework on the alternative protein. Uh, for example, we have been involved in the, uh, the, the policy paper issue released by FAO in, in April this year. They have, uh, they have had a global expert meeting in Singapore to sort of uh, come out with a global standard on this uh, cultivated meat food safety considerations. And um, we're also very happy to share with you that uh, uh, the next FAO uh, global expert meeting will happen, will take place in uh, November this year, and then we will be uh, sort of uh, free out uh, all the guidelines on other alternative food, including plant-based and the precision fermentation and so on. Uh, so this is uh, how we, we work with uh, a global organization and to sort of uh, align and uh, facilitate the uh, harmonization and globalization of all these uh, production processes. Yeah. And, and what I think is also helpful is that within the, the region, Singapore is known to have the golden standard of food safety. So having Singapore taking a leadership role here and sharing their, their learnings and um, their best practices with other regulators um, is super helpful and they're actively doing this. So um, in the end of October, we have the Singapore International Agri-Food Week, which is the regional's largest agri-food um, conference and the Singapore Food Agency has a specific day, um, which is called the uh, regulatory, regulatory Roundtable, I think, um, where they invite um, regulators from all around the world to come and discuss novel food regulations. Um, and my team, GFI APAC, is also working towards the same goal, also together with SFA, so the Singapore Food Agency, um, but other regulators in the, in the region as well, and with the APAC Society for Cellular Agriculture, um, to get the regulators hopefully to harmonize eventually on novel food regulations because that is obviously one of the big hurdles that we need to overcome. Um, there was one other public-private partnership that you would like to speak a bit about, SIL, another one that you are overseeing. William uh, wears many different hats, so please share a little bit about this one. Yeah, oh, before I mention SIL, I'd like to thank uh, Ming Hao A-Star's uh, leadership in setting up this tripartite uh, partnership initiative in the food safety assessment uh, 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 initiative called Future Ready Food Safety Hub. This is uh, hosted at NTU, so we work very closely with uh, industry and government agency to sort of uh, uh, develop uh, uh, food safety innovations to make sure that uh, novel food uh, that will come out to the market are safe for consum uh, consumers. The second one is uh, actually set up by um, Enterprise Singapore that is called Singapore Agri-Food Innovation Lab. In fact, it's not a lab, it's more like a platform to connect the uh, solution provider with demand drivers because often we see a lot of startups, they, they sort of are very passionate but there's a need for them to have a market uh, demand, uh, understanding of market demand. And this is where we, we this uh, sale stepped in to help co uh, make the connection. Uh, but we do, we do not just focus on product development in Singapore because we know we don't produce any food. So it's very important that we uh, collaborate and partner with regional partners uh, to sort of cover from the farm to fork. So in this uh, 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 perspective, we actually work with uh, countries in like Thailand and Vietnam and to sort of uh, establish a, a technology partnership such that uh, uh, in, time, in time of crisis, we can overcome together instead of just doing the uh, cash transaction to buy food. And uh, one of our students actually recently won the hackathon in India. Uh, and so this is uh, in the food, food technology uh, area of development. Yeah. I, I think Singapore is doing a really great job in um, getting the industry players to seize the opportunities of innovation and to really facilitate that connection between what happens in the universities and what happens in the large corporations, what happens in the startups, bring all those people together and actually make it work. Um, 
another country that sees the uh, opportunity, the economic opportunity of, of alternative proteins is India. So um, let's hear from uh, our managing director of GFI India about what's happening on the ground over there. Thank you, Mirta. I think India might be one country, but it's really culturally complex. An India of many Indias, as we often say it, but there's so much opportunity for blended solutions to come about. India has an abundance of crops locally. It's the largest producer of pulses, legumes. Um, these can go directly into the plant-based protein value chain, right? We also are the home for the largest and most cost-effective biopharma, as well as the bioprocessing industries in the world. We're primed for large-scale bio uh, biomanufacturing that's required for cultivated meat, as well as fermentation-derived protein. So I'll give a couple of examples here, right? So contract manufacturers like Loris Bio runs the world's first CDMO plant. It's dedicated to novel proteins. It's servicing customers around the world. They develop um, animal origin free recombinant proteins, growth factors, you know, cell media, um, supplements, all of those things which really meet the cost and scale requirements. Another example I would say is also the fact that Loris is developing a facility for fermentation um, that's almost going to have 2 million liters of capacity. That's, you know, 10 times what it is currently. So there's so much that, uh, that we have promised for. Um, Firmbox, you know, Firmbox Bio is another example in the same vein, but they're veering towards precision fermentation. String Bio is another example of the advanced bioprocessing. Um, talent that we have, and, and I think I could go on, but the opportunities are only getting more exciting. Currently, uh, if I give a summary, India has 113 active startups across the all protein space. There's a further network of 100 companies that are bolstering these 113 startups. Um, I know that the traction is more on the plant-based side in terms of products on shelves, but also there has been two startups within the cultivated meat and one in cultivated seafood last year. So that's quite exciting. I know Bruce mentioned in his opening remarks about uh, the cultivated meat grant that came through for India in 2019. And I know there's been lots of numbers been thrown around, but it was first, it was first there in terms of 640,000 US dollars, you know, one of the biggest grants for cultivated meat for its time. So there's so much um, there. I think on the plant-based side as well, we've had BIRAC, which is the biotechnology industry um, research assistant council you know they've given 130,000 um, USD towards all protein R&D we've had the ministry of food processing support uh, B veg foods with 100 and um, 1.2 million actually USD when it comes to cold chain infrastructure so there's so much on the public um, private partnership um, I also want to give shout out to the Central Institute of Fisheries Education. Dr. Goswami is over here. He received, their institute received uh, a significant amount of funding to be able to start and institute that first cultivated seafood research center in India. So the possibilities are only getting started. That, that all sounds amazing and very, very promising. Um, is there maybe one more thing, like a recent achievement that you would like to highlight that you think is like most promising? Yeah, I know we're pressed for time, but um, I, I just want to highlight that the journey for India shows how much progress we've made to date. Um, but I'll skip to something that only happened two months ago. So in August, um, GFI India was a part of the sectoral committee under the aegis of the Department of Biotechnology. And we are actually supporting uh, in terms of the biomanufacturing plan. Um, so it's very exciting that we are going to be a part of all the four subgroups, uh, plant-based, cell culture, microbe derived, as well as the food safety and regulatory side of things. We're getting the opportunity to work with esteemed scientists, um, technical experts to make sure that we are anticipating gaps and the aim here is to strategize how all proteins can be a huge part from a biomanufacturing lens to bolster India's already um, very exciting biotech sector. So I feel like the road in India is long, uh, but India is vibrant, India is complex. So I think as long as we have champions that are in government, in academia, um, in industry that can come together to keep 
building the momentum on this journey. I'm very excited about where we go. Um, the All Protein Project from India as well. I can see Arman over here and other, other colleagues of his. I think they've done so much to build the university talent piece as well. So yes, I'm sure there's lots more that we can do. We're only 15, but uh, yeah, uh, it's a long way. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing, Sneha, and Doris, Minhao, and William. Thanks very much. Um, it's very exciting to hear about all the public-private partnerships um, happening in our region, and we only touched upon just a very few, um, but it's great to see because these public-private partnerships are the building blocks um, of our roadmap towards a more secure, sustainable, and just protein supply for all. So I am giving the floor back to Bruce for some final remarks. All right, I have uh, two very quick announcements uh, and then a very quick close. Uh, announcement one, uh, the poster presentations. You probably just on the other side of the screen um, seen the posters. There are 30 scientific posters out there. Um, three of them um, are original research from GFI. Uh, ten of them are research from GFI's university chapters, the Alternative Protein Project, and 17 of them um, are research that GFI sponsored through our research grant program. Announcement number two, if you are a government official or you work in policy for a government, you are cordially invited to a special networking event, a meet and greet, which is hosted by GFI and the Israeli consulate in San Francisco. You can learn more about our approach to developing a national alternative protein strategy and connect with like-minded individuals. So again, if you are a government official um, or work in policy for a government, please join us immediately after this in Building C, Room 210. Uh, and then closing, um, I hope everybody here is as inspired uh, by that global walkthrough that we just got, uh, just now from Singapore, China, and India, before that from Israel, Brazil, and Europe. Um, I want to leave you with just a couple of things. The first one is that right now the world is on a trajectory uh, to produce 60% or more industrial animal protein through 2050. Alternative proteins are a better way to satisfy what appears to be an innate human desire uh, to eat animal meat, dairy, and eggs, and there doesn't appear to be a plan B. Uh, second, what you have seen is the briefest imaginable shot, snapshot of what is happening to change that trajectory and to meet consumers where they are. The people in this room, all of us, all of you, are focused on working with governments, we're working with scientists, we're building a scientific ecosystem, we're building support that is going to be necessary to make alternative proteins no longer alternative. We are, of course, working with industry, and a huge shout out again to GFI sponsors um, ADM, Cargill, CP Foods, all the way here from Bangkok, um, and Givenon for being absolute leaders um, on this transition. Um, and the goal is to give people the meat that they love, uh, but without the same external costs. And there is, as I mentioned earlier, um, a huge industry and jobs payback if we get this right. Um, if you don't currently receive GFI's monthly highlights report, I hope you will sign up uh, at gfi.org slash newsletters. It's a little shot of adrenaline every single month, a lot of the cool stuff that's happening um, in the U.S. Um, each of our affiliates also has newsletters, which you can find at gfi.org. Click on global in the upper right-hand corner, and you can sign up there. Um, the third thing to say, this theory of change is not self-actualizing. Uh, it does require all of us. So if you are in this room, uh, you are the change that all of us wants to see in the world. Uh, so thank you. And then finally, yesterday was amazing. I hope you were as um, inspired as I was by the sessions. We have another wonderful day. Uh, we hope it's educational. We also hope that it's inspirational. It's a choose your own adventure sessions um, and a lot of time for networking. So I'm super excited to be in this room with all of you. GFI exists to help you to work on this together, so let us know what we can be of, do to be of service. Um, with that, I'm going to wish everybody another awesome day, uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody back here for the final session. It's going to be focused on alternative proteins as climate action. Um, and thank you all so much. We're thrilled you're here. <laughs>